Hello again, everyone. I'm Dr. George Simon, and welcome to another edition of the new Character Matters program. This is the program where we talk about what I consider to be the defining issue of our time, the character crisis that we've been in for some time now, and that affects every area of our lives, from our community affairs, our world affairs, our political affairs, our family relationships, our most intimate relationships. Every aspect of our lives is affected by character issues. And toward that end, I've been working my entire professional life, not only to sound the alarm about the crisis that we're in and how it came about and what we need to do about it, but also to help folks better understand the nature of the beast, so to speak, what we're dealing with and how we have to deal with it, not just among each other, but within ourselves. And today I'm going to be uh, expanding upon a topic that I introduced last week uh, with regard to the process of change for someone who has significant character issues to deal with. There's a lot of misinformation out there. A lot of misinformation. By nature, personality and character disturbances are resistant to change. That's by nature. So it's difficult for individuals with these disturbances to grow. Folks become set in their ways. They do not only what appears to work for them, but they do what comes naturally to them. And they also operate in a way that's compatible with the image that they'd like to fashion for themselves. In psychology, we have a fancy term for this. We call it egocentonia, which means that uh, the way I style myself, the way I present myself, the way I like to be in my relationships, the way I like to interact, the way I prefer to see things and do things is compatible with the image I want to have of myself. It fits. It's natural for me. And therefore, I'm reluctant to change things, even in the face of difficulty. It's much easier, of course, anyway, to blame other people, places, and things for my misfortune than to fault the very approach I've taken to life and my relationships. So it's difficult for persons who have personality and character disturbances to grow, to change. But it's not impossible. And there are two huge barriers in our day and time, even in our day and time, that make it more difficult than it needs to be. Number one is the fact that when someone comes to that point, that they have gotten a bit sick and tired of being sick and tired and have begun to think that maybe, just maybe, their way of seeing and doing things isn't working that well anymore. And they're at least considering the prospect of changing, growing, when that happens, unfortunately, too many times, the right kind of intervention is not available to them. Similarly, when an individual is in a relationship with someone of disturbed character, and they finally pressure that person to seek some kind of counsel, if they don't get the right kind of counsel, if they don't find someone well-grounded in understanding and dealing with character disturbances, they're likely to be able to successfully manipulate the situation. They're also likely to encounter the kind of intervention that the best science says is not going to work, most likely. 
And therefore, the person who sought the help, who managed to pressure their partner into some kind of counseling, is likely to feel even more defeated and to experience what we call therapy-induced trauma. That's the kind of trauma that happens when you go for help and you end up feeling worse for the effort. Maybe your character disturbed partner has good impression management skills, knows, to, knows how to cast a favorable impression, knows how to charm, knows how to look good without being good. Maybe they're capable of pulling the wool over the counselor's eyes. That can induce such trauma. Maybe the therapist operating from a framework where everybody contributes to the problem uh, wants to focus too much on the person who's been on the receiving end of a lot of gaslighting and a lot of manipulation, making them feel like it's partly their fault. There are all kinds of things that can go wrong when the right kind of intervention doesn't happen. And that only reinforces the belief, the very common and erroneous belief, that there is no hope. Now, there are cases with significant disturbances of personality and character. And remember, remember this, if anything, more importantly than anything, character disturbance is a spectrum phenomenon. It varies as to type and degree. Not all character disturbances are so ingrained, so severe, and so resistant to modification that nothing can be done. There are those cases. There are those cases where a person's hard wiring is so ingrained, so dysfunctional, and whose way of operating has been so reinforced that they have absolutely no motivation to change it. There are those cases where all of the things that we know to do at this point in time are likely to fail. There are those cases, but they're not all the cases. In fact, they're not most of the cases. So it is an erroneous belief to simply write off all character and personality disturbances is untreatable. The bigger problem, the bigger problem is getting expert proper treatment. That's one of the reasons why I wrote all of my books, especially my latest one, Essentials for the Journey, explaining the life lessons that can and must be mastered for someone to grow in character. And I'm approached every single day by individuals who have gotten to that point in life, some in their 50s, 60s, 70s, some even in their 80s. They've gotten to the point in life where they realize that the way that they have styled themselves, the way that they have always been, just doesn't seem to be working anymore and they have come to appreciate that they must do some changing. And now they're really stymied because they don't know how. And in times when they've reached out in the past, they haven't gotten what they needed. Now I'm going to make a uh, an oversimplification here on purpose. Just to illustrate a point, within the field of psychological disturbances of one kind or another, there are two basic kinds of problems. One kind of problem happens when people who are basically decent sorts, when there's nothing wrong with the person as a person, they have decent morals, they behave within proper boundaries, and limits, 
They have decent character. But something's gone wrong with their biochemistry. Or maybe something's gone horribly wrong in their environment and traumatized them in a very deep way and now they're having an unhealthy reaction. In those cases, we have very good interventions to help people work through their traumas. And when they do work through their trauma, they are the same decent character that they always were. But then we have an entirely different set of problems when it comes to individuals whose very way of being is the problem. How they've chosen to define themselves, how they've preferred to operate in the world is itself the problem. With those kinds of problems, our psychology has been woefully lacking and woefully lacking for years. But there is some hope for the majority of cases, provided the intervention is correct. Now, I mentioned last time that we've had it very, very wrong with regard to the concept of shame. I'm not going to mention any names. You can draw conclusions for yourself. But I saw a, an interesting uh, video on the internet the other day of someone apologizing for an egregious behavior or so-called making a so-called apology for an egregious behavior. And it was curious the way it was framed. The person was musing that he was finding it hard to find a way to be genuinely remorseful without being ashamed of himself. Shame has to do with the kind of person we are. And yes, it is true that many times what we think of ourselves can be toxic, can be truly toxic and detrimental to our growth. But sometimes, sometimes we have every reason and have every ought to feel shameful about the way we have defined ourselves, about the ego we have constructed for ourselves, about the way we have chosen to distinguish ourselves among our peers and others. And it's that very shame that can help us turn things around. So I want to be clear about this. The so-called science of shame has it partly right. Sometimes it's really toxic to feel badly about who you are, as opposed to what you've done. It can be really, really damaging to a person with fragile or poorly developed self-esteem or a self-image. But it's not always a bad thing. As a matter of fact, for some people with certain kinds of character disturbances, where their ego is inflated already, where their sense of self is inflated already, and it's not a compensation for underlying feelings of insecurity. It's real. It's pompous. It's arrogant. Sometimes in those cases, a dose of healthy shame is just ticket. It's just the opening door. It's just the key, the very key to beginning a significant turnaround in one's life. There are some things that have stood the test of time. Lessons from life itself. And in our vanity, even within our sciences, we often think that we know better. Time is the teacher. Life is the teacher. We have only to humbly reckon with it 
and to unbiasedly sift through the messages that it gives us. The answers are always out there and ours for the taking. All we need to do is cast our biases aside, open our hearts, and humbly reckon with the truth. That's easier said than done. Much easier said than done. So, if you'll permit me for a moment, I'll engage in a little shameless promotion. The only way I know to get the message out there about all the things that I've learned and that people have taught me because everything I've learned has come from the folks that I've worked with is that growing becoming a better person for all of us is possible there are a few cases I will admit where the challenge is more than our present capacity to deal with. So there are, at least in today's age, with the tools that we have and the knowledge that we have, there are some what you might call hopeless cases. But that's not all of it. The bigger problem has been how we have reckoned with the issue. And also how we have reckoned with the factors in our culture that have reinforced and rewarded disturbances of character to an unprecedented degree, which is why we find ourselves in the state that we're in. Nothing shocks me anymore with respect to the outrageous things that make the news from time to time because it's actually all around us all the time and we don't notice it. If the person driving in front of us can't resist the urge to go 65 miles an hour in a 25 mile zone and can't apply the brakes as they approach the stop sign and actually come to a full stop, if a person feels so entitled to get what they want at any price and without due concern and who regards the rules as just a suggestion, a suggestion that they can take and maybe abide by if they have a mind to, if that's the predominant attitude and believe me, it is for so many of us, then what's to stop the person when a major life disaster happens, when their heart is ripped up, when they're angry at the world, when everything's fallen apart and they feel like they want to kill somebody. And so they do. It's no surprise how we got to where we are. It's been insidious, incremental, slowly but surely. And the answer lies where it always has, character. And there are ways to foster it. There are ways to develop it at any stage of the game. And that's what I'll keep talking about, and writing about, I invite you to go to my blog at drgeorgesimon.com and avail yourself of the hundreds of free articles. They're there and they're there for free simply because I want folks to have the information even if they don't have a mind to or don't have the resources to purchase one of my books. But if you do, I encourage you to do so, especially uh, my latest labor of love, Essentials for the Journey, can help anyone on the road, I truly believe, discover a stronger, more purposeful sense of self. So thanks again, once, once again, for tuning in. 
And I invite you to tune in next time for another edition of the New Character Matters. Until then, I'm Dr. George Simon. Take care.